Roland stood atop the Roland-class warship. Apart from the flagship named after him, the rest of the ships were slow and cumbersome cement vessels. But one day, he believed, he would have his very modern fleet. Nightingale adjusted the tresses of her hair that had been tousled by the wind. Noticing Roland's upbeat mood, she asked if he was excited about returning to his homeland soon. With a smile, Roland shook his head. He had no intention of returning to the royal capital. The border town is his only home. His joy came from the hope of swiftly quelling the disputes and ending all conflict within the Grey Castle. Nightingale detected that Roland was only telling a half-truth. Caught off guard, Roland almost forgot Nightingale could discern lies. Coughing a few times, he admitted that he was immensely proud of having constructed so many ships in such a short period, precisely just within the month of the demons. Nightingale nodded, although this time it was a heartfelt confession, it did sound a tad boastful. Roland blushed, explaining that was why he hesitated to tell the truth initially. Nightingale chuckled lightly, stepping closer to assure him. She wasn't upset with Roland. Unless it concerned her directly, she didn't mind him telling some small lies now and then. Turning her gaze forward, Nightingale softly thanked him. Confused, Roland looked at Nightingale. Slowly, she explained her gratitude, under his leadership, whether common folks or witches, all would be able to live happily. Although Nightingale always believed Roland would achieve this, she hadn't expected the day to come so soon. Roland took a deep breath, telling her they are not quite there yet. He was aware that even if Timothy was overthrown, most of the nobles would resist and struggle desperately. Fully unifying Greycastle might still take several years, perhaps way longer than what Nightingale had previously anticipated. With a soft voice, she admitted she was actually worried if she'd live to witness the day. Roland playfully flicked Nightingale's forehead, admonishing her to not speak such nonsense. Roland would never let Nightingale put herself in danger. Rubbing her forehead, she argued that as a combat witch, she was naturally on the front lines. Changes come with a price, she added, revealing that from the moment she pledged herself to Roland, she was prepared for what might come. Placing a hand on Nightingale's shoulder, Roland gently shook his head. He said he was sorry to disappoint Nightingale, while there would be a cost. But most of it will be paid by their enemies. Besides, he continued with a touch of gratitude, he owes a great debt to all of them. Nightingale looked puzzled. With sincere emotion, Roland confessed, had he not met the witches, he might not have been so quick to take this step. Maybe, deep down, if this world lacked its wondrous magic, he'd still be in some barren border town, living a primitive life, constantly on edge. Looking up at him, Nightingale realized that every word Roland spoke was the unvarnished truth. Suddenly, lightning and Maisie descended from the sky, landing beside Roland and Nightingale. Lightning reported, 20 kilometers away, for single-masted ships are approaching. They have oars on both sides and look a lot like the hawk-headed ships mentioned in the intelligence reports. Lightning piped up, saying, but she didn't see any hawk-shaped statues. Patting her head, Roland explained, the hawkhead probably refers to the ramming prow underwater. Telling Lightning continue to monitor them and stay safe. The young girl gazed up at the prince with teary eyes and asked, can she do one less set of exercises as punishment? Roland chuckled, saying, if she promises not to dash around recklessly in the future, she can just do one set. Lightning's eyes immediately brightened. Without wasting a moment, she leaped up and soared back into the sky. Nightingale commented, Roland shouldn't have done that. Roland waved while saying rewards and punishments make lessons memorable. The two returned to the command room. The rifle battalion's commander, Brian, the first army's commander, Axe, the artillery battalion's commander, Vayner, and Captain Kakusim stood by a table, awaiting Roland's strategy for their upcoming naval battle. Vayner was the first to voice his opinion, it's hard to hit a moving target with their cannons. He suggests that they get closer before firing. He promises if they are within 50 meters, every cannon from the battalion can capsize an enemy ship. Brian shook his head, cannonballs consume a lot of gunpowder, 
and currently, only Miss Anna can produce it. He suggests that they wait for the enemy to approach and then use the side-mounted machine guns to turn them into sieves. Roland turned to Captain Kakasim, questioning what was the captain's take? After hesitating for a moment, Kakasim bluntly stated, they should just ram into them. Both Brian and Vayner stared incredulously at Kakasim. Kakasim slowly says, the Roland is both larger and faster, and it's made of steel. A wooden ship might just fall apart upon impact. Even if it doesn't break apart, the flooding from the damage would incapacitate them. Upon hearing this tactic, an image involuntarily formed in Roland's mind. Both their ideas seemed aligned. He finally decided, let's do it. Roland gave the order. The flagship, the Roland, hoisted the flag of the city of Neverwinter and sounded its steam whistle. Full speed ahead. Eden was a newly appointed knight from the royal capital, leading one of the ships meant to blockade the Western Territory's trade routes. If successful, he'd not only amass a great fortune but also earn a promotion. What he didn't realize, however, was who he was truly up against. A lookout sailor yelled, activity up ahead. Eden moved to the bow of the ship, squinting into the distance. Far away, plumes of black smoke rose, as if something was burning in the water. He could faintly discern a gray silhouette approaching. Undoubtedly, it was a ship, but what struck him odd was the absence of any noticeable sails. The crew observed that the oncoming ship moved at an incredible speed. Eden noticed it too. Even if it was downstream, its speed was astonishingly fast. The other two hawk-headed ships had also spotted the incoming vessel. One of them began rapidly moving its side oars, seemingly eager to be the first to board this peculiar merchant ship. A sailor chuckled, those guys love hogging the glory. Wasn't the merchant ship they nabbed this morning enough for them? The sailor then turned to Eden, asking if they should charge forward too. After pondering for a moment, Eden replied, no rush. They should observe for now. As the approaching ship became clearer, Eden's eyes widened in disbelief. Not just him, gasps of astonishment echoed across the deck. A sailor atop the mast shouted, my god, captain, what is that thing? A deep horn sounded, echoing past everyone. The approaching ship not only maintained its speed but also slightly altered its course, heading directly for the foremost hawk-headed ship. With no time to maneuver, the Roland rammed headlong into the unsuspecting belly of the hawk-headed ship. The sound of splintering wood echoed crisply in everyone's ears. The slender wooden warship, as if struck by a massive hammer, lurched heavily to one side. In mere moments, the ship began to fall apart and sink. Upon seeing the colossal gray ship shatter the hawk-headed ship without losing any momentum, Eden was stupefied. Even though he didn't recognize the flag, in his mind, only the rumored prince of the Western Territory, said to have fallen with the demons, could produce such a thing. Men on the deck sprang into action, some readying crossbows while others loaded their newest weapons. Escape was out of the question. Grinding his teeth, Eden ordered, hasten towards the shore. Realizing their speed was insufficient, he figured hugging the riverbank would be their only defense against the oncoming ram. With the surge of the waters and the sudden maneuver of the gray iron ship, the bent hawk-headed ship finally detached. The second hawk-headed ship desperately attempted to change its course, aiming to distance itself from the adversary. But the grim reaper's horn sounded again. The Roland, with its deafening roar and trailing thick black smoke, accelerated, heading straight for the ship closest to it. The second ship met the same fate. Under the pressure of the onrushing metal behemoth, the warship's side was forcibly plunged underwater. Those who could, jumped into the water to save themselves, while others not as fortunate screamed and tumbled across the tilting deck. Eden was petrified, lost for words. In mere moments, two hawk-headed ships had sunk, and the one under his command seemed destined to be next. For a split second, he was ready to abandon the ship and flee. But, by some stroke of luck, his gamble paid off. Observing that his ship was now entirely close to the shore, the enemy adjusted its course, pursuing the last retreating ship. 
Eden realized that even if he managed to escape and return to the royal capital alive, it would be of no avail. He had to defeat this rebel ship and present it to King Timothy as a badge of merit. He knew the ship might have been forged by demons, but its crew was human, just like them. He ordered everyone to raise their bows and firearms, preparing to board and overpower those within the iron ship. Bellowing, he proclaimed, for every man they kill, he will reward the brave warrior a gold coin. Hearing this, the sailors' courage surged back. Confident they wouldn't be rammed, the hawk-headed ship left the safety of the riverbank, progressing alongside the Roland. Soon, they were about to overtake the Roland, and the distance between the two vessels narrowed to a mere few meters. The sailors brandished an assortment of weapons, readying for an initial onslaught. Aboard, men aimed at Roland with a variety of weapons, including bows and arrows and the latest firearms bestowed by Timothy. However, they inflicted no damage. As they were about to climb up to the Roland, the deck of the Roland appeared deserted, but Eden spotted a long barrel surrounded by metal, with small holes exposed at the center. Before the crew could even make any move, flames burst forth from the barrels. Sailors dropped like harvested wheat. Those who reacted sought cover, but no hiding spot could shield them from this terrifying weapons assault. Bodies littered the ship. Bullets penetrating their bodies. Even the mast, under the relentless assault of this fearsome weaponry, could not withstand, and with a creaking noise, it broke in two. The glory Eden hoped for never happened. He realized they faced a type of firearm, with an extraordinarily rapid rate of fire. He couldn't fathom how, in the hands of the rebel prince, a weapon known for slow reloading and imprecise aim became so devastatingly effective. Why were the weapons Timothy gave them so inferior and useless? Unfortunately, he didn't get any answers. Soon, a rain of bullets enveloped him. The last ship lay paralyzed in the center of the river, signaling the end of the battle. The air was filled with the enemy's moans and cries of pain. Those who survived had lost all will to fight, swimming towards the riverbank. The artillery battalion was somewhat disappointed, having missed the chance to showcase their latest cannons to the rifle battalion. As everyone placed the cannonballs back into their boxes, someone remarked that compared to the ammunition consumed by the machine guns just now, a single cannonball wasn't much more expensive or troublesome. Vayner frowned, these were handcrafted by Miss Anna herself. How can he compare them to the machine gun bullets they can produce by the hundreds daily? He instructed his men to aim carefully during the later siege, telling them to not ruin the reputation of the artillery battalion. Someone boasted, he promised to blast open the royal capital city gates in three shots or less. All eyes turned to Rodney, expecting him to chip in. Cleaning his gun, Rodney mused, he wishes he had a ship like this as well. His eyes sparkled as he repeated, he wishes he had a ship named the Rodney. Hearing this, Rodney's older brother stepped forward, shouldn't that honor be his first? As Rodney's elder brother? Rodney chuckled, he won't give this opportunity away to anyone. Vayner joined in, the second ship could only be named the Vayner. Catclaw then asked, what about the the Catclaw? Staring at Catclaw. In unison, everyone responded, no way. Amid the light-hearted banter, the fleet set sail once more, heading towards the royal capital. Two days later, they arrived at the royal capital, with its walls now visible in the distance. Lightning, responsible for scouting, reported, a troop is stationed at the dock ahead, roughly a hundred men, not heavily armed. Roland was slightly taken aback. It wasn't surprising that Timothy had defenses set up at the suburban docks. Surely, Timothy must have received news of their fleet through the carrier pigeons. However, the fact that only a hundred men were positioned at the dock was unexpected. Roland had assumed that Timothy would have archers and firearms positioned along both riverbanks and might even have set up trebuchets to intercept their landing. It seemed Timothy had given up on the advantage of attacking them mid-crossing. Could Timothy possibly know the range and power of his 152mm naval cannon? Shaking his head, Roland thought it unlikely. He then turned to Sylvie, asking if she could spot the militia carrying the church's pills? 
Sylvie used her magic eyes for observation. She didn't see any pills. Most don't even have weapons. However, there's something strange underground. They've buried some things, clay pots and wooden barrels filled with a black-gray powder. Nightingale instantly thought of gunpowder. Roland then realized Timothy's strategy. The group of around a hundred men was merely bait sent by Timothy to divert their attention. Their real intention was to wait for Roland to approach the deck and disembark, then set off the gunpowder. The dock was the essential path, and Timothy clearly recognized this fact. However, instead of mounting a direct defense, he opted for a hidden ambush, trying to catch them off guard. If not for Sylvie, they might have fallen straight into the trap. Now that they've discovered it in advance, the solution seemed relatively simple. Without wireless detonation capabilities, Timothy would undoubtedly have stationed personnel nearby to ignite the gunpowder. All they needed to do was neutralize them beforehand. Either way, they had to secure the dock, or it would be challenging to get the artillery and ammunition onto land. Roland asked Sylvie to help him identify the ignition points. He then instructed Nightingale to infiltrate, locate, and eliminate the individuals set to light the gunpowder and secure the area, preventing any potential backups from igniting the explosives. Leaning against the battlement of the western wall of the royal capital, a knight peered through his binoculars, monitoring the canal's activity. He had spotted Roland's fleet. He hadn't expected Roland to truly dare launch an attack on the royal capital. Chuckling, he mused, ever since the construction over 200 years ago, this royal capital city has never faced an assault. Any adversary, upon seeing its majestic tall stone walls, would lose the courage to attack. But he had to admit he admired Roland. No one else dared to challenge their enemy at their most formidable point. It's a pity that Roland was an adversary. But being a knight of the royal capital, he had a duty to protect it at all costs. A soldier rushed up to report, the rebel prince's fleet has arrived. The knight set down his binoculars remarking he was already aware. He then issued orders, first and second cavalry squads, mount up and stand by behind the city gates. As for those mercenaries, just have them follow the cavalry closely. Ensure everyone readies the city's defense weapons. Also, get the oil pots heated. Although he didn't think Roland would come close to the city walls, it didn't hurt to be prepared. He jestingly warned his subordinates not to wet themselves when the gunpowder explodes, causing a round of hearty laughter among the surrounding knights. According to the plan, once the rebel troops occupied the dock, flags would be raised from the city walls. At that signal, the high explosive snowpowder buried near the dock would be detonated, undoubtedly causing heavy losses and chaos within the enemy's ranks. Following that, the city gates would be opened, and a cavalry charge would seal their victory. He raised his binoculars once again, puzzled about how a ship without paddles and sails could move. Nonetheless, he deemed it irrelevant. Regardless of how unusual a vessel might be, it couldn't march on land. The strange ship gradually slowed down and eventually came to a halt opposite the dock. Another knight also lifted his binoculars, jesting, could it be that the mere hundred-man militia has scared the rebel prince? As the others looked on in confusion and the knight was about to say more, a burst of flame suddenly ignited from the front end of the ship. Only moments after the flash of fire did they hear a muffled boom. It had precisely exploded near the wooden hut meant to ignite the explosive powder. From such a distance, they couldn't understand how they were being attacked, but the knight suddenly realized, could the enemy have known about the snowpowder buried at the dock? Information gathered from various sources indicated that the rebel prince possessed incredibly powerful weapons. Their range and accuracy far surpassed the iron tubes forged by the blacksmiths of the royal capital. Therefore, from the very beginning, Timothy has decided not to confront them head-on but instead set up an ambush with explosive barrels of snowpowder, rendering Roland's weapons useless. Soon, a second warehouse was blown up. With this, Timothy's ambush plan was rendered completely fail. At that moment, a loud explosion echoed from the city walls. 
Countless amounts of soil and rocks were thrown into the air as all the snow powder buried in the ground was ignited. The knight cursed furiously, who was the fool who ignited all the snow powder without waiting for the signal. The dock was turned into a mess of craters and pits, with countless militiamen and knights killed or injured. The knight ordered his subordinates to raise the blue flag. Suddenly, another massive sound resonated, causing the entire city wall to shake. This time, the anomaly was the city gate. A large gap appeared in the massive gate, and yet the enemy was still miles away. Someone shouted, it's the demons, the demons have come. The scene, already chaotic, erupted into pure pandemonium. The previously prepared cavalry turned their horses around in retreat, and the mercenaries in the back began to flee as well. The leading knight was still trying to control the situation, but the thick smoke and the smell of blood prevented him from uttering any commands. At the same time, a hot air balloon approached above the city walls. Wendy pulled a lever, releasing a bomb from its bracket, which plummeted to the ground. Lightning effortlessly caught up with the bomb, guiding it straight to the city wall. As it descended, the young girl saw the horrified expressions of the knights on the wall. The bomb struck the wall with a massive explosion, creating a huge gap. Those nearby were instantly consumed by the ensuing flames. The previously prepared hot oil splattered everywhere falling onto the soldiers guarding the city walls. Moments before, the knights who had been preparing for battle were now scattered and fleeing in panic. Many lost their way in the thick smoke and fell off the wall, others writhed and rolled on the ground, trying to put out the flames engulfing them. Looking at the smoking city wall of the royal capital, Sylvie's face showed a hint of reluctance. She slowly said, their defense has collapsed. Nightingale, expressionless, said, they got what they deserved. If they had one, they would only become more ruthless. Roland took a deep breath saying, either way, someone has to pay the price for this conflict. If not the enemy, then it will be them. He didn't want to lament the cruelty of war at this moment or cherish the value of peace. It was a struggle for power, a battle for survival, and a clash of ideologies. Soon, the horn for the final assault echoed over the dock area. The first army, fully armed, led by axe, prepared for the last push. Amidst the smoky city walls, the first army quickly broke through the main gate. Their target was to seize the royal palace gates. Once inside the inner city, the pace of their advance abruptly slowed. Here, they met a powerful counterattack from the enemy. Members of the first army were continuously injured, and those hurt were immediately pulled to the rear by their comrades, waiting for Nanawa's medical assistance. Field guns couldn't be brought forward due to various obstacles on the path, but they had no time to think about alternatives. The fully armored knights, boosted by the church's berserk pills, charged wave after wave. A burst of gunfire sounded, and the berserk knights at the front were riddled with bullets and fell, but the ones behind continued their charge undeterred. Even when shot in the arm or torso, their speed didn't decrease. The squad captain, after dispatching the enemies in the front, began to issue the next set of orders. However, their enemies weren't just attacking from the front. Suddenly, a group of berserk knights leaped from the residential houses on the side streets, smashing through the windows. Before the soldiers could turn their weapons, the berserk knights had already started attacking them. One of the first army soldiers was cleaved in half by a knight whose eyes glowed a fierce red. The squad quickly killed the knight, but more were pouring out of the houses. The formation of the soldiers was disrupted, leading to close-quarter combat. Continuous screams and shouts of pain filled the air, and the first army soldiers were injured one after another. Although terrified, their training kept reminding them that only by sticking together and utilizing their collective strength could they possibly survive in the face of such powerful enemies. They kept pulling their triggers, gradually reforming their formation. At that moment, reinforcements arrived. The artillery battalion had encountered trouble on East Street, but the heavy machine gun unit had come to their aid. The squad leader yelled to make way for the heavy machine gun. The Maxim heavy machine gun was dragged onto the street by the reinforcements, and after setting up in a firing position, it unleashed a hail of bullets onto the berserk knights launching another wave of assault. 
The dense stream of bullets formed an invisible wall, halting the Berserk Knights in their tracks together with the first army soldiers, the Berserk Knights were taken down one by one. By the time the gunfire ceased, white smoke was billowing from the barrels of the guns. The ground was littered with the bodies of the Berserk Knights. Those who were shot but not instantly killed writhed on the ground, groaning in pain and agony. The Berserk Knights continued their relentless attacks on the soldiers of the First Army even on the floor. Remembering their fallen comrade, the squad showed no hesitation and swiftly ended the enemy. Once the path was cleared, the First Army was able to advance once more. Different units and squads began to converge from various directions. As a hot air balloon loomed over the royal palace, more bombs obliterated the garden wall and iron gate. The final assault had begun. Inside the palace, Timothy sat on his bed. His royal guard rushed in, urgently informing him that the enemy was at the palace gates, hinting at a hasty retreat. Timothy sat silently, contemplating his next move. The very room brought back memories of his father's tragic end, and now, it seemed history was about to repeat itself. Writing on the death of Wimbledon III, Timothy had cunningly shifted the blame onto the elder prince, Gerald, eliminating the major threat and ascending to the pinnacle of power. In the span of a year, he had managed to consolidate the eastern and northern territories, also forcing his younger sister, Garcia, into exile. His influence seemed unmatched. He had believed that the western territory would inevitably be his, and uniting the entirety of Greycastle was just a matter of time. Yet, he had not anticipated the sudden and swift turn of events. In merely three days, his world had crumbled, leaving him with nothing. Timothy furiously slammed a candlestick from the bedside table onto the floor, venting his anger. He shouted furiously, This is all witchcraft. If not for the witches and demons, how could Roland's weapon be so powerful? His voice was strained, filled with rage, and a slight tremor. The church is useless. They claimed to hunt witches, yet they missed Roland Wimbledon. If it wasn't for witches, how could Roland's weapons be far superior to his? No matter the wealth, labor, or territory and resources, Timothy's advantage is hundreds of times greater than Roland's. There's only one explanation, the demon is helping Roland. The constant explosions and clashing of swords outside momentarily calmed Timothy. He couldn't die now, he needed to seek revenge. Looking at his guard, he ordered, into the secret tunnel. The knight escorted Timothy into the hidden passage, which was known to have a dead gate. Once the dead gate was activated, the entrance would be sealed forever, blocking any potential pursuit. The passage was filled with traps and stones of God punishment. Timothy was sure Roland would be clueless about this place. In the secret tunnel, Timothy pondered his next step. He needed the support of the loyal nobles and dukes. Although uncertain of their loyalty after Greycastle's fall, he knew he needed to give it a try. Or perhaps, he should seek refuge with the church? If the church could help him in avenging his loss, so what if he handed the Greycastle over? The thought consumed him, rapidly growing stronger and more intense with each passing moment. If he could personally send Roland to the guillotine and torment every one of Roland's witches, everything would be worth it. In the dim light of the torches, Timothy made up his mind. He and his guards chose the longest tunnel and made their way out of the royal capital. However, as they emerged from the secret tunnel, they found themselves surrounded, rifles pointed directly at them. For a moment, despair washed over Timothy.